Hey, this is Ralph, and in this video, I want to go over some skills for this assignment we have in class about using Excel to solve some relatively common kind of money issues, money challenges, let's say. So uh, the Excel workbook that you were provided has these five sheets. I'm going to go over how we can solve the challenges on each of these five sheets. And my goal for you is to actually work on this independent first. Um, you know, make your guesses, try it out, think through the problem, and then if you get stumped, come to this video and go to the section. I'm gonna have little chapter uh, links down there at the bottom too, so you can jump to the particular area that you are, uh, you're stumped on. So I'm gonna start off here. I'm on uh, exercise one, Excel one, uh, calc percentages, okay? So there's a couple things to work on over here. And the first thing to do is to take some existing amounts, pay rates, and increase them all by 10% using Excel. And I'm thinking this would really even be easier if this little 10% was off in a cell by itself. So I could do that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and tweak it here. I'll just put new pay rate there. And then I'm gonna write a little 10% right in this cell. And I guess I'll go ahead and bold it too so it looks kind of like it's part of that thing. And I wanna put these new amounts on here. Now keep in mind, in this video, I'm using a slightly older version of the worksheet that you are likely seeing, but the skills are all really the same. You might have some different numbers and different values, maybe a few different colors and things like that, but it's the underlying skills that are still the same. So I wanna write a formula here in C2, and let me go ahead and zoom in a bit on this. I, I wanna write a formula in C2 that's gonna show that 10% increase over uh, what's in B2. And for all of this kind of stuff, we wanna write our formulas in a, in a good proper way so that we only have to write it one time, and then we can just autofill it or copy and paste it down to those other cells. So I'm gonna go ahead and write equals my old pay rate times, I'm gonna do this part in parentheses, one plus the 10% uh, increase there in cell D1. Now for this cell, I am gonna press F4 on my keyboard to make it an absolute reference because all of my formulas are gonna to refer to that D1 cell. Now, if you want multiple cells, multiple formulas to refer to the same one cell, you want that cell reference to be absolute. And I did an absolute column, absolute row, and uh, I mean, that should suffice. So basically what I'm doing here is I'm taking the old number, 20.01, and I'm multiplying it by 1.1, because obviously we know what one is, and then 10% is the same as 0 0.1. One plus 0.1 is 1.1, which is gonna give me a 10% increase over this existing pay rate. Not the only way we could write this formula, by the way, just the way that I'm using. And I'm gonna go ahead and press enter. And fortunately, this is a number where I can kind of do the math in my head. 10% uh, of 20 is two, 20 plus two is 22, and then we got the penny on there as well. So that one looks accurate. Now, I'll just go ahead and select that, double click my fill handle, and it's gonna bring that formula all the way down. So if I go to one of these other formula, there we go, B12 times one plus D1. That absolute reference means they're always gonna to refer to that D1, whereas a relative reference, notice that, is B12. And then if I look at another one, the relative reference changes to B22, whereas the D1 is still the same. And I think we can call that one complete. Let's look over here. So in this one, I want you to display a percentage change. And by the way, I do have directions over here. Calculate the gain loss percentage for each of the stocks based on the different stock prices. Cool. Okay, so gain loss percentages. Now for something like this, I think the easiest kind of formula to write is new minus the old divided by the old. So I'm gonna head over to my first one here in row two. I'm gonna write equals, and I'm gonna use parentheses here. The new number, the newest of the two numbers, the new minus the old, closing parentheses, divided by the old. New minus the old divided by the old. And when I press enter, oh, I get something a little bit weird. I do wanna show a percentage, a gain loss percentage, and this is a decimal format. So while I'm still here on this cell, I'm gonna change it out to a percentage display, and what the hell, I will show a, um, 
uh, decimal point. Looks pretty good. And I'll just double click the fill handle to auto fill that down. And I can see that numbers that started off at like 10.55 and went down to 10.29, they're negative two. Now we can test this as well. So we could do something pretty easy. I'm gonna pick on this particular row right here. I'm gonna change this to 100 as the old price and 200 as the new price. Well, we know that's doubling. That's an increase of 100%. That makes perfect sense. Now, if our old number was 100 and our new number was 50, that's a decrease of 50%, negative 50%. So once we can see that working with the numbers we can do in our head, we should feel really confident about these other returns on there. All right, I think we're gonna call that one good. I'm gonna jump over to uh, uh, exercise two. This is choosing A or B. So I've got a few scenarios in here. Now, once again, on your sheet, um, these scenarios could be a little bit different. But um, we want to look at a couple problems and write some Excel formulas that will help us determine what the correct or the better financial decision would be. So in our first situation, let's go ahead and zoom in on this. I'm looking at a couple of computers, a computer that's $1,050, bucks, 15 percent off, or a $1,100 computer that's $200 off. You may be able to do the math in your head. You may be able to guess well, but I'm going to be looking to see that you actually write math or Excel formulas in here to prove your decision. So let's try this out. Computer A, um, that's 15% off. Well, if I were to take equals 1050, the price of the computer, and multiply it by 0.85, that's going to give me 85% of the computer price, which is the same as 1 minus 15%. 1 minus 15 or 100 minus 15 is 85. And there we go. I'm using the same logic that I did on that other sheet with 1 plus 0.1 or 1 plus 10% in order to produce that resulting multiplication formula here. So let's see. Um, so that's going to give me 85% of this computer. And I can see computer A is 892.50. I'm going to go ahead and convert that into currency. No, I will not do that. Uh, that takes it to accounting. There we go. I'll put it to cur uh, currency. There we go. And that's going to give me the floating dollar point sign as opposed to the fixed dollar point sign. Now, this one's going to be really easy. Equals 1100 minus, there we go, 200, $200 off, and that's a $900 computer. And I'm going to go ahead and just do a format painter. There we go. So now we know that one computer, computer A, is $892.50. The other computer is $900. Therefore, computer A is the better one. Now, in the directions, after you type a formula for both options, change the background fill color of the best answer to green. Perfect. Oh, that's easy enough to do. I'll, I'll do both of these. I'll uh, see. That's uh, the fill. It's right up there. And I'll just choose a light shade of green. And I'll do the same down here for this one. Oh, I can just click that. Okay, so that's our first scenario. I'm going to scroll down to this other scenario. A job that pays $29 per hour for 40 hours per week or a job paying $58,000 per year. Okay, so for this one, we need to get these into common units. And we could put these down into, uh, we could figure out uh, a weekly amount and compare the two, or we could figure out an annual amount and compare the two. Either would work as long as you're calculating accurately. So let's see, a job paying 29 per hour for 40 hours a week compared to a yearly 58,000. Well, we need to know obviously how many weeks are in a year. Well, we happen to know there's 52 weeks in a year, which means if we were to take this first formula equals 29 for $29 and uh, multiply that by 40 for 40 hours per week, so that would be the weekly pay, and then multiply that by 52. Now, sometimes people might choose 50. In fact, in, in, we want to take an hourly pay rate and quickly figure out what it might be for an annual pay rate. Um, the easiest thing to do is to multiply by 2,000, which is easier than you might think, approximately 2,000 hours uh, per week, or I'm sorry, per year. So 29 times 2, that's going to be uh, 58. And then 50, you know, times 1,000, so 58,000. So it sounds like this would be pretty much the same. However, if we go by the more accurate 52 weeks per year, we will see that this 
$29 an hour job is actually paying $60,323. I'm gonna make that into a currency. So $60,320 compared to the 58. Now, this one's not too tough because we already know the annual amount here. So equals 58,000. And I'll just do a little format painter to bring that over. And I'm gonna get rid of the decimals, I think. Cool, so now we can see, all things being equal, the job that's paying $29 an hour is the better job to go for if we're only basing this particular decision on the salary. So again, I'm gonna select both of these cells, click, control, click, and I'm gonna change the background to green to show that that's the one that I'm gonna go for. <clears throat> Let's scroll over to the right and see what we've got in store. Which of the following hiking boots is the best deal? I'm seeing a lot of PCT hikers um, lately. So if you're hiking a big trail, whether it's PCT or Appalachian Trail, you wanna try to get some boots that are gonna last you, or trail shoes, which are gonna last you as many miles as possible for the price you pay. Once again, there's a couple ways we could look at this. We could look at it cost per mile, or we could look at it the number of miles per dollar or something like that. So let's see, Boots A. They're $110 and they're in theory rated for 1,400 miles and Boots B are $180 and they're rated for 2,600 miles. Well, I'm gonna do miles over price, which is gonna give me the number of miles per dollar. So let's see, equals 1,400 divided by $110 and that's gonna give me 12.7 miles per dollar, okay? Um, not too bad, let's see. What else have we got? Let's jump over here. Equals 2,600 divided by $180, and that's gonna give me 14.4 miles per dollar. So this is making it sound like that Boots B is the better deal because even though the boots are more expensive, I'll get more mileage out of them can't remember what the PCT is. It might be around 2,600 miles. can't remember. Um, so this is going to give me more, pile, uh, more miles per, uh, uh, per dollar spent on the boots. So the, uh, the more expensive ones, in theory, maybe higher quality, better mileage, literally. Okay, now what if I was doing this the other way? Price divided by miles. We can do that. We just want to be consistent. So I could change this first formula to equals 110 divided by 1400. And that gives me 0.07. We can read that as basically eh, 0.078 is about 8 cents. And let's do the same for this one. Equals 180 divided by 2600. And that gives me about 7 cents. So seven cents per mile versus 7.8 cents per mile or 6.9 cents per mile. So even if we did it this way, now we're looking at a, a price value, not miles. We want the most miles or the least price. In this case, they're the same thing. So the least price boots per mile is this one right here. So that's the one we wanna go for, Boots B. Let's check this out, gym memberships. Okay, $50 sign up fee, then $19 a month for two years. Got it. So equals $50 plus. Now remember, when we're writing in dollar amounts in our formulas, we don't put um, dollar signs or anything like that because dollar signs in a formula mean absolute reference. So 50 plus, and I'm gonna do this part in parentheses, 19 times 24 for 24 months, 12 months per year. And that's going to give me a total cost for gym A as $506, okay? And then gym B is simply 20.99 for two years. So equals 20.99 times 24, and that gives me 503. So once again, option B on this side is the better deal. And now we can kind of see that based on some simple formulas, we can make decisions that may have been kind of tough to do without crunching the numbers. We may have bought the, the ultimately the more costly boots, may have signed up for the more expensive gym and stuff like that. Um, now I think I've used this assignment before and I think one of your classmates from a prior term brought up something interesting on this gym one. I can't remember exactly what his scenario was, but um, 
what happens if it went for three years? Okay, so right now, this one's the cheaper way to go. But if we went for three years, this would be 36 months. And if we change this one to 36 months, yeah, that's that was it. So at two years, if you knew you were gonna, only gonna be a member of this gym for two years, then option B is the better way to go. But if you thought that you might be there for three or more years, then option or gym A is the way to go. That's the cheaper one to do more long-term. So yeah, interesting observation. I'm gonna press Control Z to undo, Control Z to undo again, and put that back to the scenario. But I thought that was a kind of a cool point. That yeah, even though there is that sign-up fee, over the longer term, this lower monthly cost starts to uh, save money there. Okay. So in fact, another Excel scenario I should be doing is uh, we're gonna get solar panels on our house and what's really the payback period for solar panels um, based on how much will you save per month and how many years will it take before the savings um, meets or exceeds the cost of getting the solar panels installed. So we'll find out later on. Let's see, I think we're pretty good, pretty good there. So I'm gonna jump over to number three, the car payments. Um, okay, so this should be pretty easy to work on here. I've already got it set up in part for you here. We've got the calculators labeled out. And of course, there are resources on videos on how to go through this. The one that I think I see students get tricked up the most is right down here, this credit card payment calculator where it's weekly payments. That can be a little bit tricky to look at. So we'll pause, go a little slower on that one. But let's see. So for my car payment calculator, loan amounts, I'm gonna write equals the price of the car minus, oops, I already screwed up. Let's try this again. Equals, oh, I'm pressing the minus sign. Equals the price of the car minus the down payment. So the car costs 34K. We're going to put 8K down. We're going to borrow 26,000, basically financing the rest of that car price. Okay, 60 months, 5.5% interest rate. Now, I'm gonna jump over here to the mortgage payment calculator because this is, part is kind of the same. The loan amount for a house, of course, we're in uh, Central Oregon, so the odds of finding a $300,000 house are a joke. So let's change this out to 550. And I'm gonna change the down payment to 110. Okay, so the loan amount is still gonna be equals the price minus the down payment, and that's your loan amount. Really, the only difference with car loans and house loans is car loans are almost always expressed in months, so a 60-month car loan, which is five years, and house loans are almost always expressed in years. 15-year mortgage, 30-year mortgage, and occasionally you might see 20-year mortgages, but uh, 30 is probably the most common one there. And we've got interest rates for both and the monthly payment calculation is gonna be almost identical, but not completely identical. Very, very similar though. I'm gonna work over on the car payment first. So I'm gonna write equals PMT. I'm using the payment function to calculate the monthly payment for my fixed rate loan. And that's what all these are, by the way. Uh, car payment is a fixed rate loan. Mortgage payment is a fixed rate loan. Credit cards are a fixed rate loan, assuming you just you stop using them and you're locked into one particular interest rate um because they can change you know every year or two or sometimes every couple of years depending um so let's see i've got the payment now the first thing i need to put in is, is the rate so i'm going to take my annual rate and divide it by 12 to get into monthly terms because i want monthly payments i need to figure out the monthly information here uh car car loans house loans they have a monthly compounding credit cards monthly compounding almost all of them anyway some credit cards might have daily compounding, but most are monthly. Okay, I've got the rate, comma, then the number of periods. Now, I want months, and my car loan is already in months. That's good, so I can just click on the cell that contains the 60, comma. Now, for the present value, I'm gonna write a negative, type a negative, and then I'm gonna click on the loan amount. Make sure you get the loan amount and not the price of the car. So there we go, closing parentheses, and I'll see that this car payment has a monthly payment that is $496.63. I'm gonna do something very similar for my house. Equals PMT, 
parentheses. The rate is the annual rate divided by 12 to get to months, comma. Number of payment periods is the number of years times 12 to get to months, comma. And then the present value is gonna be a minus loan amount. Closing parentheses, press enter. My monthly payment for the house is gonna be a little over two grand, 2,075 and 34 cents. Okay, so now I've got the monthly payment for the car and I've got the monthly payment for the house. Total paid, total paid, finance cost, finance cost. The total paid is everything you had to pay, at least price-wise, for this car. Don't think about maintenance and oil and gas and all that kind of stuff. Total paid is gonna be equal to, parentheses, looks like a little frowny emoticon. It's gonna be my monthly payment times the number of months I've had to pay it. Technically, I guess I didn't need the parentheses here, but I like the parentheses sometimes to kind of fo focus my attention on the key parts of the formula. So since multiplication occurs first, before addition anyway, um, this would have worked fine without that. But I need to figure out the, my monthly payment times the number of months I paid it plus that down payment. Don't forget that big check you had to write. So basically, excuse me, every check you had to write totaled up for this car. So total paid is gonna be 37, about 37,800. The car was 34 grand, but because I chose to finance part of the car price by getting a loan, and that loan required that I pay interest, that means I really paid more than what the uh, car was worth. The finance cost is gonna be equal to the total paid minus the original price of the car. What did I pay extra? Obviously, if I just walked in with a briefcase full of cash, I could have just paid for the price of the car. But um, since I financed it, I had to pay a little bit more. I had to pay about $3,800 more since I'm financing it with a loan. Same thing for our house. The total paid is gonna be equal to the monthly payment times the number of years we paid it times 12. Remember, we have to pay it 12 times per year for 30 years in this example. Plus, and of course I don't need the parentheses because the multiplication will occur first, plus that big down payment of 110K means the total paid for this house is about $857,000. The price of the house when purchased was 550, but you're gonna pay over 30 years um, about 857,000. So that's a pretty big impact on, um, on, on a house purchase is that total paid. Now, of course, the, the good news is, is over 30 years, in theory, the value of that house will, will exceed what you have paid. So that would be kind of uh, uh, promising there. Now, if our mortgage was shorter, instead of a 30-year mortgage, if it was a 15-year mortgage, the monthly payment goes up really big. Remember it was like two grand before, now the monthly payment is $3,200, but the total paid drops. Because we're paying off that loan faster, we don't pay as much interest over the life of the loan, which means your total paid is a lot less. So if possible, it's nice to get a shorter term loan um, knowing that you're gonna have higher monthly payments, but your total paid is gonna be a lot better and you'll pay off the loan sooner, which means then you can take that money you're spending on mortgage payments and put it into other things. Uh, finance cost is gonna be the same. That's gonna be equal to the total paid minus the original price of the thing, in this case, the house. Total paid is 100, or the finance cost is 141,000. Again, because I'm financing it with a loan. Now, if I put this back to a 30-year loan, payment drops back down to 2,075, the total paid increases and my finance cost goes up because I'm having to pay so much more over the price of the house because I'm financing it with a long-term loan. Okay, so those are done and accurate. Let's scroll down a bit here. Now, very, very similar, credit card payment calculator. Let's say I've got $11,000 of credit card debt and I've cut up the credit card, I'm not using it anymore. The credit card is charging 14.9% and I have a goal of paying it off in 48 months. This is gonna be just like the uh, car payment calculator. 
my monthly payment will be equal to PMT opening parentheses. Uh, my rate, my annual rate divided by 12, comma. My number of periods is in months, 48 months, comma. Now, since I don't have a loan amount, well, I kind of do have a loan amount, but there's no down payment. The loan amount is the credit card debt. That's what credit card debt is. It's a loan. You're borrowing that money to buy stuff, and then you pay back the credit card company. Okay, and that's going to be a minus sign with my credit card debt, closing parentheses, press enter, there it is. My monthly payment, assuming I'm not going to add to the balance, is 305.58. My total paid is going to be equal to my monthly payment times the number of months I pay it, 14.6, and the finance cost is going to be equal to that total paid minus my credit card debt original credit card debt. There we go. So if you pay it off all at once, it's 11 grand. If you pay it off over four years, you're going to have to pay about $3,600 extra. But that's sometimes what you got to do because maybe you can only put, you know, $305 towards that credit card debt. Now this one's going to be very, very similar, except I'm trying to trick you a little bit here with this weekly payment scenario. So we do need to keep an eye on that. Um, we don't want to generically assume that there are just four weeks per month because that's not true because if there were just four weeks per month every month would be 28 days and that's not the case so we need to be a little bit more accurate it's still going to be an estimation but we want it to be a very accurate um, estimation so first i want to know how many weeks are in a month so i'm just going to do this right down here on the bottom here equals let's assume a typical month has yeah, 30 days why not and I'm gonna divide that by seven days per week and I can see that there's really closer to 4.285 um, weeks per month so we'll just say 4.29 okay so that's good to know so if there's 4.29 weeks per month and we know there's 30 months if I were to take 30 and multiply that by this so I could do equals 4.285 times 30. That's going to let me know really there's 128.57 weeks in 30 months. I am going to need to know that. Uh, actually, I'll really, I, I can just use this number here, the 4.285. So let's get to this weekly payment equals PMT, parentheses. Now our rate, we have our annual rate, but I'm going to divide that by 52. 52 weeks per year, which is a close enough approximation. So that's going to give me my weekly interest rate, comma, the number of payment periods. I'm going to click on the cell that contains the number of months, and I'm going to multiply that by 4.29, okay? So 30 months and about 4.29 weeks per month, that's going to give me the number of weeks in that period comma and then the present value is easy just a minus sign with uh, the credit card debt 7500 closing parentheses and I'll press enter about 6976 per week the total paid is going to be equal to my weekly amount multiplied by oh how many weeks did I pay it so this is where I can do multiplied by this times 4.29 there's my total paid and my finance cost will be equal to my total paid minus 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 my credit card debt there we go so there's the weekly scenario now I'm actually kind of curious we've got our credit card debt over here that we're going to pay it off monthly let's compare a monthly payoff to a weekly payoff so the credit card debt 11,000 I'll change this one to 11,000 number of months is 48 I'm going to change this number of months to 48 months Interest rates are already the same. Here we go. So in one scenario, if we pay off our credit card monthly, we're going to spend $305 per month. Or if we pay it off weekly, we'll spend about $71 per week. Notice the total paid, very, very similar, but it's actually a little bit less if you pay weekly. And your finance cost over that four years is a little bit less if you pay weekly. And this is true, by the way. So if you were to pay off your credit card or if you pay off your car loan weekly rather than um, monthly, you'll actually end up paying a little bit less. Now, keep in mind, especially for car loans, some car loans may not let you pay 
um, weekly because then each payment is less than your calculated payment, so it's a little bit weird that way. Um, but uh, credit cards, you know, should be able to do that. You could even go online and do that. You can usually set up uh, automatic payments on a credit card, and you could have that go weekly and stuff. Okay, good to know. All right, I think that takes care of our car payment sheet. I'm going to jump over to the saving money sheet. This can be a pretty tricky one here. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a bit on this. So we got a couple scenarios. Um, we've got young uh, one young woman uh, who's going to wait until she's 32 and then she's going to invest 2400 per year. Another one is 22 is going to start investing right now and will stop after 10 years. So basically it's a quick little comparison. What happens if you invest now versus if you wait and invest later? And maybe you could even guess at what the answer is. It's probably going to be the, the one that doesn't seem to make as much sense. Here we go. So we've got one woman who's investing. Um, so we can kind of see the scenario here. Now I'm actually kind of curious how much total. So let me just, I'm just going to go ahead and select all of these. Oops, went a little bit too far. And I'll just do a quick sum. And I can see that basically, so this first woman, let's see, I want to center that. And I'll bold it. So the first woman is going to basically invest $81,600. I'm going to copy that over here. The second woman is going to invest $24,000. So we can kind of see. All right, so who's going to be better off? The woman who invests 81 grand or the woman who invests 24 grand? Let's find out. Okay, now this can be a little bit tricky, but you know what? Something else I'm going to do is I'm going to take the 10% annual return that we're uh, using. I'm just going to put that down here in a cell by itself. I'll stick it right there. 10%. And I'll bold that so I can see it clearly. All right, well, let's start off. Oh, you know, is it, is it going to be easier to start off over here? I think it will be. I'm going to start with woman number two since we've got some amounts here. Now, there's really two ways you can think about this. Neither is wrong, by the way. But is, is the woman investing the money at the beginning of the year or the end of the year? And you can go either way. You just want to make sure you do the same scenario for both investors. So that way you're doing a real comparison. So if I invest $2,400 on January 1st in 2022, that means I'm going to get some return, investment return, on that amount in that very first year. But obviously, if I wait and invest it on December 31st of 2022, that means I'm not going to end up with any growth for that first year and my balance would simply be equal to that first investment amount. So it depends on how you want to go. And either way is good for comparing two scenarios just depending on if you're comparing them equally. Okay, let's say I don't want to do it that way though. Let's say I'm going to assume that I'm going to get that uh, return. I'm investing at the beginning of the year. So that means I invest 2400 at the beginning of the year. That's going to be equal to my investment times, actually I could do the one plus again. Um, I'll do it in parentheses though. One plus that annual return right there. I'll do an F4 on that. And there we go. So if I invest 2400 at the beginning of the year, I get a 10% return on that money. I'm going to have 2640 at the end of the year because I've got interest on it. Okay, well, that's pretty good. And by the way, I could do the same thing over here. It's pretty easy. I could even copy this and paste it to this woman. And of course, she invested zero at the beginning of the year, which means she's got zero at the end of the year. Great. Now, let's go to the second year. That'll be a little bit different because the second year includes not only the origin, the, the ending balance from the prior year, but now I'm throwing in an additional money. So let's see. This is going to be equal to, I'm going to do parentheses here, my previous balance from about December 31st plus my new investment from January 1st of the next year. Okay, so I've got this really big number, right? I've got 2640 plus 2400. So what do we got there? So that's like um, like over five grand. So we've got this $5,000 and I need to increase this amount by 
10% because not only do I get 10% on this 2400, but I get 10% on that 2640 because it's already in the account. So I take the sum of those two things and I can multiply them by one plus that 10%. I'm gonna make the 10% absolute or that cell reference absolute, there we go. So I'm gonna increase the sum of those two things. And so by the end of the second year, I've got 5544. So I've, I started with nothing, basically. I invested 2400 at the beginning of the year. Then I ended up with 2640 at the end of the year. Then a couple days later, I invested an additional 2400 on top of that 2640. And by the end of the year, thus that sum grew to 5544. We only really have to do those first two years, those first two payments, investments. Now I can just double click my fill handle, one, two, and it's gonna keep compounding. Now notice, even though I don't, I get to a point where I don't add new money in, my account balance keeps growing, keeps growing, getting bigger and bigger and bigger by 10%. So on a year where I had, oh, this will be easier. On a year when I finished with 50,900, of course, 10% of that is about 5,900, um, uh, so about 6,000. So even though I don't add new money, my existing money grows by that 10%, by that six grand, because it just keeps getting that rate of return of 10%. And so by the time this woman retires at 65, she has a million dollars. Let's see, I'm gonna make that a green background and bold, there we go. So she invested 24 grand and builds it up to a little over a million dollars because she started early. Now we can do the same kind of thing over here. In fact, I could, it's good practice to do the formula again, but I could just copy this formula from notice I'm copying it from the second year over to the first woman's second year and paste. And it's still zero because she's still investing zero. But now I can double click the fill handle on the second one. And finally she gets going. So the first woman started at age 22 and stopped at age 31. Whereas the second woman doesn't really even get going until she's 32 years old. So she starts to invest the 2,400 per year. And again, it grows at the same rate as the first woman's did. 2,640, 5,544, 8,738. That's all same because they're investing the same amount and they're both getting that 10% return. But the second woman, it just takes her so much longer to get to that million dollars. At the same retirement age of 65, I'm gonna format painter this. Oops, that didn't work. Let's try that again, format painter, click. There we go. So even though the first woman invested over $81,000, her retirement nest egg is only 650 grand. So she had to invest more to get less because she waited later. The first woman gets all this compounding early on and she has something called time value of money. Um, she has a longer time horizon, which means that money has more time to compound over and over and over. So basically this little exercise besides, you know, just practicing some formulas with Excel is hopefully encouraging you, if you haven't already started, start investing early. It doesn't have to be 2,400 a year, even with smaller amounts. So if it wasn't 2,400 a year and it was 900 per year, there we go, 900 a year, total investment, 9,000, 900 a year for 10 years, and you get 403 grand. But if this woman did it, 900 per year, her total investment is 30 grand, only 243. So even though the numbers might be smaller in those investment amounts, um, it definitely pays to start as early as possible. Even if you're not 22, you start right away. Okay, um, and by the way, if this were to keep going, could I just do this? Yeah, so if she doesn't stop, just keeps putting in that 900, her total investment is almost 40 grand and she gets up to 646. Yeah, that's pretty cool. What if instead of 900, she was back to investing, let's say 2000 a year. It's gonna grow, 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 and she'll end up with about 1.4 million. And of course, if we go back to that 2400 and she doesn't stop, um, we're getting into the 1.7 million range. Not bad. Okay, so that's pretty cool.
And I think that concludes that. So either way, we do the numbers as long as we keep these uh, things equal. Then, um, you know, like the rate of return and stuff like that. Then obviously investing early is the way to go. And uh, woman number two, uh, that's Selena over here on the right, I guess. Okay. Last but not least, thanks for sticking with me on this. So, And remember, you all have to watch the whole thing, of course. In theory, you've already tried this assignment and you're jumping over to the parts that you found particularly difficult. All right. Last but not least, we have some future value calculators. Let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit more on this. Future value calculators are similar, but not exactly the same as payment calculators. So where payments uh, look at the payment of a fixed rate loan, a future value amount is kind of like what we just did with um, Sarah and Selena here. We're basically going to use a function to figure out how much the uh, person will have in some future date based on some regular investments and a regular fixed rate of return. So let's see what we got here. Retirement ages. We got a couple scenarios here, but we can do the formulas the same. So years left to retirement is going to be equal retirement age minus current age. That's the years left. Let's do this one equals the retirement age minus the current age. Okay, someone has 41 years left, someone has 37 years left. Someone's gonna invest 300 a month, another person's gonna invest 150 per month. Someone's gonna get an 11% rate of return, the other one's gonna get a 10% rate of return. Future value equals FV, parentheses, the rate is the annual rate of return divided by 12 to get it to months. Since these people are investing monthly, we convert it to monthly terms. Comma, number of periods, 41 years left times 12. How many years are in for 41 months? I don't know, I can't do that math in my head, but I can certainly type the number of years times 12. Comma, payment is gonna be a minus sign and then the monthly investment, investment amount. Closing parentheses, press enter. This person's gonna have 2.8 million. Okay, let's do the same thing over here for this other calculator, equals FV, parentheses, the rate is the annual rate divided by 12. Now remember, this person's got a lower rate of return and they are investing less per month, only 150 instead of 300. Comma, number of payment periods is the number of months. Oh, and they're also doing it for fewer years, fewer months. Number of years times 12, comma, negative version of the monthly investment closing parentheses, enter. This person will have about 700 grand at age 55. Oh, they're retiring a lot sooner. What if this 18 year old retired at six, oops, that's a nine, at 62? Oh, there we go, 1.4 million. What if they invest or retired at 65? 1.9 million. What if they retired at 68? 2.6 million, all right, not too bad. Either way, it looks like this other person over here is a little bit better off, mostly because they're investing more per month, but they're also expecting a slightly better annual rate of return of 11%. And uh, although the past year is not has not been that great of a return, uh, a little bit uh, flat or negative, depending on how you invest, um, over the long, Hall over 40, over 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, um, estimating 11% is perfectly reasonable, assuming you're thinking about 30 years going out. All right, so now we've got those calculators. Let's look at these down here. Uh, these are done for weekly investments, so similar but different. So $200 per week, that's a lot. So that's obviously 2468, that's over $800 per month. Remember, it's not exactly four weeks per month. Let's see what we can do here. Years left to retirement equals retirement age minus current age. And then I'm gonna take that, copy that formula, pop it right over there. Okay, what else do we need to do? Weekly investment, we got weekly investment. Rate of returns are the same. Okay, let's try this out. Future value equals FV, parentheses. The rate is the annual rate divided by 52, remember, weeks. We're compounding weekly, 52 weeks per year, comma. Number of payment periods, years left to retirement. Oh, this should be pretty easy actually because we have years now. I can click on the number of years and multiply it by 52 because I know there's 52 weeks per year, um, comma. 
And then our weekly investment is gonna be a negative version of our weekly investment amount, closing parentheses, press enter, uh, 6.7 million. I know that sounds like a lot. Well, it is a lot. Um, it doesn't just sound like a lot, but this person is reasonably young, only 30 years old. They're gonna be investing for 39 years and they're putting over $800 a month into their investment. That's a big chunk of money. Um, if you went up to this person up here and they were investing 850 per month, they too would have a really big future value. It's not easy to invest 850 per month, but if you have the means and you can, you would be much better off investing 850 a month than making uh, you know, $700, $800 monthly car payments and that kind of thing. So, all right, so we've got that information. We should be able to do the same thing over here. I'm gonna just rewrite it. Future value parentheses, the rate, annual rate divided by 52 weeks per year, comma, number of years times 52 weeks per year, comma, negative version of our weekly investment, closing parentheses, enter, 1.5 million. Remember, this person's only putting in $100 a week, or this person was putting in $200 a week. What's What does it look like if things were the same? Of course, when you're 18, it's tough to come up with a you know $200 a week, but $100 a week might be more doable. But what if they were the same? What if this was also retiring at age 69, current age was 30, um, that gets the years left the same. All things being equal, 200 bucks a month will get you to 6.7 million. 100 bucks a month gets you to 3.3 million. Okay, so you can kind of see how that difference kind of plays out. And if we just make that 100, what if it's 125 a week? Jumps up to over 4 million. If it was 150 a week, jumps up to over $5 million. So it doesn't take much, especially when you have a long time horizon. If your current age was 25 instead of 30, just that extra five years, big, big impact. What was that again? So for 30 years, if you're 30 years old, $5 million. If you're 25 years old, $8.8 .8 million. If you're 22 years old, $12.3 million, okay? Again, this is assuming when you're 20.